When I was a lot younger, I was raped and I was also molested for a few years in my life. And as a result of that, I made some terrible choices. I left the church because I assumed that people were talking about me and because I didn't have my own personal relationship with God, mm -hmm. I left God. I was a yes woman, like mm -hmm. as in I would say yes to every and anyone because I so desperately wanted to be liked by everybody because to them I seemed extremely successful. And I was like, uh, no, 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 not even close, mm -hmm. not even close. All right, welcome everyone to another episode of Meta Transitions. Today we have with us Jenna. She is the person behind the new ministry, Mended by the Maker. I'm so happy to have her with us. She's going to share with you her story and um, hopefully will give us some tips as well that will help you to be able to figure out a way to transform and uh, transition well. Welcome, Jenna. Thank you so much for having me. Thank yes. you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. All right, so let's get right into it. Jenna, what is your story? Well, <laughs> um, I guess my story started at an early age when I was a lot younger. I was raped and I was also molested for a few years in my life. And as a result of that, I made some terrible choices mm -hmm. in the way I carried myself, the way I dealt with situations, the way I spoke. Um, I didn't, I chose not to put things that were important where they should be, if that makes sense. So for example, in my high school years, School was absolutely not important to me. So I played around in high school. There were always teachers along the way that would always say, you know, you have so much potential. Why are you doing this? You don't have to do this. And I always thought that they were raining on my parade and would always question, you know, why are you saying this to me? Like, mm -hmm. you know, what potential are you talking about? So yeah. people, not only teachers, even like some of my um my church brothers and sisters, aunties and uncles, yes. as we used to call them when we were younger, would also have these, you know, comments to make up uh, regarding me. And I always thought like, no, you know, th th that's not me. It's what you want me to be, but it's not me. As a result of um, me just basically not loving myself, I, I left the church because I assumed that people were talking about me. And because I didn't have my own personal relationship with God, mm -hmm. I left God. I remember there was this uh, one time, I think I was maybe 14, and I was at the mall and with um, someone that I considered a friend. Yeah. And this gentleman said to me, oh, you look like a Christian. Mm -hmm. and I had my Peter moment where I was like swearing and I was like, no Christian, I am not a Christian. Don't you have to call me that. Yeah. And some words came out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. Like I, I say my Peter moment because it just kind of reminded me of when Peter denied Christ, right? Yeah. And he was swearing, he was adamant that, you know, he didn't know God. And so that was my Peter moment. And, um, I, as I continued through life, I just kind of winged through life. I had the mentality that I didn't need to save anything because Jesus was coming soon. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't need to prepare for my future. I had, I got married early and got divorced just as early. Mm -hmm. I had three children out of that marriage. And, you know, I just kind of, like I said, just kind of went through life with no plan, no aim, no goal. Um, God was faithful. I always had great jobs. 
I yeah. should say, for my time. So I think at 16, I was making maybe $17 an hour. And mm-hmm. I won't tell you my age, but I will tell you that my eldest is 21. Yes, <laughs> so, yes. Uh, it yeah. does not show. It does not show. <laughs> like no cracker. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, like just within that, within those times, I just, I just, I don't know. I, I, I literally had no plan. Like mm-hmm. honestly, that was the bottom line. Like I had no plan. I was just kind of living life as it came. No schedule. Um, you know, told myself all of these lies that, like I said, one of them was, you know, crisis coming soon, so I don't need to be prepared for the future. Yeah. Um, yeah, just, as I'm just, like, sitting here and I'm thinking about it, it's like, what a way to live life. Yeah. yeah. You know, what a way to live life. It, it was, um, yeah, it, it definitely was, it was careless. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm having children, you know, in and out of shelters, because I was not responsible with my finances. Um, Also in and out of shelters, because I was a yes woman, like as in, I would say yes to every and anyone, because I so desperately wanted to be liked by everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted people to see that I was, um, to see that what I felt on the inside wasn't true even though they didn't see it on the outside because to them I seemed extremely successful and I was like uh, no no not not even close mm-hmm. not even close yeah. so that's uh that's basically my story wow no thank you for sharing that no I, I can't imagine how challenging it was to share that you know but I really want to you know really applaud you for just being so open and transparent, you know, with what you're sharing uh, and, you know, just laying it all out there, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I can't imagine, you know, the strength (laughs) that it took to, you know, bear three children and, you know, to sort of live this life. But I think what I'm hearing there is, and you call it careless, but it sounds a lot like survival. You're surviving. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and a lot of times when um, for individuals that went through trauma or had a traumatic past, a lot of times if it's not um, dealt with or, you know, if you don't face it, a lot of times that's sort of what is happening. Survival. You're just surviving from one day to the next day to the next day and life happens to you. Yes. Right. Um, And I think that's sort of what I'm hearing from you, from your story. You know, mm-hmm. life was just happening to you and yeah. you were just sort of taking it and, and going, you know, mm-hmm. and, I, and I sort of heard that sort of maybe low self-esteem or low sense, low sense of worth, yes. right? You didn't think Absolutely. that you deserved anything, so you just took anything. Yeah, yep. you're right. You're 100% right. I really like the way you, um, you restated that. Mm-hmm. I really like the way you restated that. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. I'm so interested, though, in figuring out, you know, how did you come out of that? Yes. Right? Because I, I know, I know you, Jenna, <laughs> like, in a sense, I know you because we've been friends, right? We've been church members. And the truth is, this is the first I'm hearing your story like this. So yeah. I'm one of the fitness, you know, sort of maybe this facade that you're talking about that everybody sort of sees, Right. So tell me more about the transformation and what that looks like. So, excuse me, my transformation. Wow. Okay. So I'm going to say maybe uh, maybe six years ago, Mm -hmm. I was diagnosed with um, potential and I always love to throw the word potential in there. Potential papillary carcinoma, which is potential thyroid cancer. They were... Even though they say potential, they say they're pretty sure. Yeah. Um, in order for them to be 100% sure, what they would need to do is they would need to take my thyroid out and run tests mm-hmm. to see if it truly is cancer. Now, I am a nurse yes. um, right now. Um, and I know that I am not created with spare parts. Mm-hmm. And a lot of 
sometimes people think, or doctors, unfortunately, some surgeons and doctors say to people, oh, you know, it's just a thyroid, it's not important. But your thyroid is so important. Mm -hmm. It's so important. And not only that, I am not the type of person that will take a pill every day for the rest yeah. of my life. Yeah. I, that's not me. And if I have to take out my body part and then use a medication to substitute that body part, then to me, that's not healing. Mm. So when I went into the surgeon's office and they said to me, you know, um, this is what we think it is. This is this, the suspicion that we have. And we would like to perform this surgery on you. Mm -hmm. To, to move quickly so we can schedule you within the next two months. Mm -hmm. I sat in that office and I was at peace. Mm -hmm. I was honestly at peace. And I felt like I heard God say, I got you. Yeah. And so in that moment, I was like, no, I'm not going to have surgery. And I was so calm about it that I'm thinking, and I don't want to mind read here, but I'm thinking that the surgeon probably felt that maybe I was in shock. Mm -hmm. And so when I said, no, I'm not going to do surgery, she was kind of taken aback. And she said to me, you know, well, what are you going to do? You're just going to live with it? And I said, no, I said, I'm going to, I said, no, what I said to her was God's going to heal me. Mm -hmm. And she kind of, okay. And I was like, yeah, I'm just going to do the natural treatments. And she laughed. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, one of the things that they taught us in school was you never ever, ever disrespect a patient's choice. Yeah. And in that moment, I felt so disrespected. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, if I wasn't, I guess, as strong as I was, I would have broke down and maybe even given in and lost hope and said, you know what, maybe mm -hmm. I'm thinking is stupid and maybe I should just do the surgery. So in any case, she laughs and I looks at her. And um, she's like, you know what? I think you need to go home and talk it over with your family. So I knew that doesn't matter what anybody said, I was not going to have surgery. Mm -hmm. So I went ahead and um, the first person that I told was um, my, my boyfriend at the time. Yeah. And then I told my best friend. Um, in any case, when I told him, he said to me, you know, I'll come back with you and see what she has to say. Because remember, not remember, but in that time, I didn't know like questions to ask because I've been just kind of surviving, as you said. Right? Yeah. So just like day to day, I didn't know what kind of questions to ask, but I already resolved that I am not having surgery. Mm -hmm. So he came back with me and um, he asked a few questions. Um, she explained how the medication worked, which I already knew how it worked. Uh, but I didn't tell her that I was a nurse. So she didn't know that I had any medical background whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So as he, as she, as he's asking these questions and she's answering, I guess he could tell that I've already made up my mind. So mm -hmm. it's not going to happen. So we come out of the doctor's office and he says to me, um, well, what are you going to do? So I said to him, well, I've already decided that I'm not having surgery. He's like, I know that. What is your plan? Mm -hmm. And that question hit me like a ton of bricks because yes. I'm like, what mm -hmm. what? Yes. Because, you know, <laughs> no longer surviving. <laughs> now you got a plan. <laughs> yeah. oh, plans. Yeah. Because that has never been something that I ever did. Yeah. And so I was like, uh, I guess I'll just do the natural treatment. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So I contacted um, one of my friends who was into the medical missionary field. Yes. And he um, sent me off to this herbalist. I went to the herbalist. I picked up all that I needed to pick up. And then I started the regimen. The challenge was mm -hmm. I have never been consistent in anything else but being inconsistent. So I was consistently inconsistent. So I had no idea how to be consistent. Mm -hmm. Not only that, I didn't... I didn't know how to start small. Yeah. So I was very um, uh, impulsive. Mm -hmm. Spontaneous. I like to say. <laughs> yes. But I was impulsive. So I would just jump right into things. Mm -hmm. And then when I got bored or I didn't fully understand what I was getting into and mm -hmm. things got hard, I would jump right out of it. Mm -hmm. So it got really challenging to keep up with 
the regimen. So I just stopped. Now, at the time, my boyfriend said to me, so I, now I told my best friend and he, he, I, you know, facts, but yeah. he also was supportive and he's like, okay, also, what is your plan? So I always tend to surround myself with people that plan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so when he came to with what's the plan I was like okay let's plan so my boyfriend at the time was um he kind of not kind of but he was watching everything that I was doing and you know he would come to me and he'd say you have to um you have to be consistent with this like this is serious you can't you know be here today and you know and and on today and then off tomorrow you have to be consistent and so I kind of like just dismissed it um and then I continued with life as it is went back to eating however I was eating drinking however I was drinking just kind of doing whatever I was doing Mm -hmm. I didn't give up but because I didn't fully understand what to do and how to do it in a way that makes sense for me yeah I just kind of like dismissed it and I was willing to try other things but I also wasn't looking for other things to try yeah yeah so throughout um our relationship he would always challenge me always like he would question what I was doing why I was doing it um he would encourage me to create a schedule just to do things that was like foreign to me yeah I, I, I thought it was him just being pushy, <laughs> being mean, not understanding that I'm a free spirit and that I, you know, just kind of did things on a whim and our relationship ended. Mm-hmm. And when our relationship ended, I went kind of back to the drawing boards and I was like, okay, so this was my another serious relationship mm-hmm. and it yeah. yeah. What is going on? Yes. Yeah. That was the moment that I realized that it wasn't everyone else that was the problem. It was me. Mm-hmm. Um, at that point, also my best friend, because he saw that I was wishy-washy in and out, in and out. And he also had um, some issues himself with regards to losing someone that was close to him because of, of cancer that hit him hard the yeah. fact that I had the opportunity to do something and I wasn't doing anything about it mm-hmm. and he decided that you know what I need to step back because if something happens to you this would almost be like twice mm-hmm. but not always it would be twice mm-hmm. and it would be a lot to have to deal with yeah. and so I completely understood that but it was losing my boyfriend at the time that really led to that transition because like I said I had to really I didn't have to but I chose to in that moment think about what what is the problem what is really the problem here and when I realized that it was me that's when I um I started to check on YouTube for certain videos um videos regarding like how to take care of yourself, yeah. self-care. Um, I researched more videos about thyroid cancer, what it really means, where does it stem from? Um, I started to look up different herbs. I started to follow different people that were doing different regimens for cancer specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, I started to actually go to the gym and be consistent at the gym. Um, that was something that my ex really tried to get me into. And I was like, I'm not having it. I'm just kidding. I don't need to go to the gym. Yeah. I'll just be cute. And he was like, ma'am, you need to go to the gym. Okay, you're getting there. You need to go to the gym. But I was not, um, I just wasn't receiving it. No, I wasn't receiving it. And after he, after he walked away, I... Yeah, the transition started. Mm-hmm. The transition started. And at first, I'm going to say, when I first started the transition, the goal behind it was, okay, one day he's going to see me and I'm going to be glowed up and he's going to come running back. 
<laughs> your whole life. No. <laughs> you know what? how lovely you are. Thanks. <laughs> but this is not about him. So now, as I'm continuing on my journey, yeah. I'm I'm literally in this space. I'm li- literally in this place for me. Yeah, I'm doing it for me, and boy, does it feel good. Hmm. I think what I'm hearing is that you finally put yourself first. Finally, recognize that you needed to take care of yourself. That you needed to do the work to be mm-hmm. able to take care of yourself. Right. So before it was all about everybody else taking care yes. of everybody else, right? Um, but you needed to, it sounds like, look a little deeper, figure out what it is that you need, figure out the growth that you needed to do in your own life, right? Yes. And then, yes. you know, start to, to do it for you. Um, yes. And it sounds like the transformation started there. And it's it's really sad that it had to start from a place of loss, mm-hmm. You know, and so many times we see in transition that, you know, a pinnacle part in a person's story comes from a rock bottom place or a place of loss. Right. So when you're in that space, you know, you can't there's nothing else to do but think (laughs) in a sense. Right. So, you know, and that's sort of what I'm hearing from you. You got to a place where you're you you lost somebody that you truly cared about or who truly cared about you and you have to look deeper within yourself to find out you know what's really wrong here Mm -hmm. and you're able to identify areas of growth and places that you can you know start to stem from and you know you're here you're doing the ministry you're you know taking care of yourself Um, so how is the cancer doing now so because of COVID COVID just won't let us be great Mm -hmm. I had not been able to go in and do my regular, I guess you want to say six month ultrasound Mm -hmm. to see if things have grown or if they've gotten smaller, like what is happening. However, what I can say is that I have noticed um, certain things that were, or symptoms that were attributed to thyroid cancer. Mm -hmm. I don't have those symptoms anymore. Okay. Okay. Daily, I have less and less and less of those symptoms. Um, for example, I don't even know, like, can you see this nodule? You can kind of yes, see it there. just a little okay, bit. So this was a mm-hmm. lot bigger. Okay. It was a lot bigger. Mm-hmm. So that is one thing that um, that I can say has changed. Uh, my nails never used to grow. I, I would show them. I would show you that they've grown, but I just cut them. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's okay. No worries. Cool. Again, COVID won't let us be great, so I have to cut them. <laughs> but <laughs> my nails did not grow. Um, I had. I would have like terrible, terrible um, cramps at times. I don't have those anymore. Um, extreme tiredness, like fatigue. Um, just my concentration would be off extremely irritable those are not issues anymore mm-hmm. yeah i'm just a lot calmer yeah if you remember the wild child <laughs> <laughs> but um, i'm a lot calmer mm-hmm. um, yeah so i i'm definitely definitely seeing a lot of changes Mm-hmm. No, I think I'm hearing, you know, overall wellness, like it's a holistic thing, right? You're able to, you know, take care of your mental health. It sounds like your physical health and spiritual health is almost like the three quadrants there, right? Um, and you're, you're, you're living your peace right now. So I'm glad to hear that at least and wish you all the best on your recovery, you know, and continue to live whole, whole, wholesome (laughs) and healthy. Yes. All right. What are some tips you could leave with our guests, our listeners, Um, things that, you know, maybe you can pass on to them, like someone that may be, you know, that has cancer, for example, or somebody that maybe has, has had trauma or went through trauma at some point, how can you, you know, what are some things you can leave with them to help them to figure out a way to transition as well? So for both of them, I'm going to start with the importance of loving yourself. Um, And it's biblical. 
right? Because the Bible tells us that we have to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. So if mm-hmm. you don't love yourself, how do you love your neighbor? Yeah. Love is also an action word. So how are you speaking to yourself? How do you treat yourself? Um, how do you see yourself? What do you say to yourself, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what do you say about yourself? I read this amazing quote that said, be careful what you say about yourself because you are listening. Mm-hmm. I that, wow, that was, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, the other thing I want to say is having surgery doesn't mean that your faith is weak. I chose not to have surgery. That was my choice. What I would suggest if you are having surgery or if you're choosing to have surgery, try to lean towards restorative surgery where they will only take out a part of the organ or even um, if you have something like nodules or lumps in a certain area, they would just remove the nodule or the lumps rather than taking out or total surgery where they take everything out. Because at least if you have parts of it, you're able to do what you can to help rebuild that part so that it's able to do the work that it was put in you to do. Mm -hmm. than having to live off of a pill that is going to have additional side effects for the rest of your life. Makes sense. Um, Mm -hmm. The next thing I would suggest is the importance of confronting yourself. Mm -hmm. It is very important. And this is more so for my folks that have had past trauma. Sometimes we bury the trauma so deep inside that we don't even think of it as trauma. And I'll give you an example. So for me, when I was, um, when I speak about the rape, I, I want to say I was between three and five years old. Mm-hmm. And we had a neighbor that was older than me. And he didn't necessarily, I don't fully remember the details, to be honest with you, but it wasn't where he tied me up. Like it wasn't traumatic like that, where he tied me up and or anything like that. But there was penetration, there was bleeding. So I knew that something happened. Right. But I was too young at that point to really understand what took place. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, with that, I never looked at it as rape because I always saw rape as something that was more traumatic. You know, Mm -hmm. you get pulled into an alley or or something like that. But Mm -hmm. the reality is that's exactly what it was, even though I wasn't pulled into an alley. So I, I always kind of played it down like it was nothing. But it was something because it affected the way I showed up for myself. It affected the way I showed up for my children. It affected the way I, I handled myself in my um, relationships, mm-hmm. right? So not only with my significant others, but just in general, it affected my my trust. So confront yourself. It, it's very important that you do the work of sitting down and saying, this happened to me. Mm-hmm. And being okay with understanding that it happened to you, then get the help. Yeah. Go to therapy. Yeah. I feel like, especially us as Black people, I, I, I'm going to speak to Black women right now, men too, men too. But as Black people, we tend to think that therapy is, going to therapy is a weakness. And it's absolutely not Or it's not for us. Like we would spend, I remember that I would spend ridiculous amounts of money for Jordans and and Nikes and all of this name brand stuff for my baby who doesn't even care to be quite honest with you because no baby cares that they're wearing Jordans. It's really for me so that I can show that I have, you know what I mean? So that I can show that I have this thing, but instead of using that money to go to therapy so that I can be the best parent that I can be to that child. Mm -hmm. They're just carrying on that trauma and onto those children who now have to deal with my trauma, even though they haven't been through trauma. Yeah. So definitely get the help. Get the help, get the help, get the help. (laughs) The help. (laughs) Um, The next thing that I would suggest is um, even if you're not used to a routine, start small start to build that routine. So one of the things that I started with was, and and this was like, this is new to me. So I'm only two years into this, okay? But washing my face. I did not, I didn't know how to wash my face, as simple as that sounds. Mm -hmm. I didn't know 
how to do that. So washing my face, just trying out different products, um, seeing what worked, what didn't work, understanding, speaking to my sister because she's like a glamour queen and she comes out and she does facials and gets her nails done and does all these things. And I'm like, wow, how do you do that? Like, why do you even do that? Just having these conversations, surrounding yourself, and, and this may be challenging for those of us that have mommy issues, um, but surrounding yourself with people that, uh, with women that are taking care of themselves yeah. and asking them, like, what do you do? What, you know, what products do you recommend? And if you, you may not be able to afford everything, but, you know, you can afford sugar, right? Yeah. Even a little sugar scrub, some sugar and some water and scrub, that's it, right? Or even honey. So just um, look up, look up YouTube, look up on YouTube, the, the these simple little remedies, things that you can do to start taking care of yourself. Um, something simple as drinking water, even. You may not be a fan of water, but at least if you say, okay, I'm going to commit to drinking two ounces of water for the day. You need way more than that. Let me just put that out there. As a nurse, as a human, you need way more than that. Yes. <laughs> but if water isn't your thing, start small mm -hmm. and build your way up to it. Don't feel like you have to rush and do everything today for today. Right, tomorrow's another day. I want you to fall because there are days where I have fallen. I'm like, okay, I have my face routine. I do it morning and I do it night. And then sometimes I'm like, ah, I'm actually not going to do it today. I'm going to do it tonight or I'm not going to do it this morning. Or things happen. Mm -hmm. That's okay. You just pick back up where you left off tomorrow. Show yourself grace. Right? Show yourself grace. Um, and then what I would suggest is after you have started to develop these new things, start looking into setting boundaries. That is so important. Set Speak some it. <laughs> boundaries are so important. <laughs> boundaries, raise your standards. So what I've learned is standards are how I choose to govern myself. Mm -hmm. Boundaries are how I choose to allow you to treat me. Okay, so that, that's that's how I learned. So raise your standards. If you are a person, so as a nurse, we have to wear scrubs. Yay us. So a lot of times we think that because we have to wear scrubs that our hair can look any in any way. Mm -hmm. You don't need to necessarily get our eyebrows done. But yes, do your eyebrows, sis. Get your hair done. Just because you're wearing scrubs doesn't mean that, you know, it, it's the end. Like you don't have to show up. Yeah. Oh, get things done, do things so, to kind of make you, you even feel like, you know, spruced up. This mm -hmm. is not for anybody else. This is for you. And you're not going to know if, if you're not somebody that's into makeup or you've never worn makeup. Um, you're not necessarily going to uh, know how to do it. Look up, so, again, YouTube, let YouTube be your best friend. <laughs> yes. No, YouTube. Right? No, for sure. YouTube has so many tips. For, and skills that you know you can use to you know do anything self-help and I've I've been doing these interviews Jenna for so like since last year and so many people have indicated that YouTube has been such a big help for them you know how to videos you um motivational videos right um to really help them to pull themselves out of the hole in a sense if you want to call it that right so definitely it's a great tip um and a resource for a lot of people, for sure, for sure. Um, and the tips that you just shared are yeah. so amazing. You know, I can't remember all of them. <laughs> this is the truth. Because you said maybe more about five or six of them. Um, mm -hmm. But no, they were really good. Uh, mm -hmm. And I and I think that people can definitely walk away with, you know, a, a message that, you know, they, they too can pull themselves up you know, by mm -hmm. the bootstraps, they too can love themselves, they too can take care of themselves, they too mm -hmm. can, you know, dig deep and, and, you know, embrace their traumas, right? Um, they too can um, make sure that they get the right treatment that is going to be aligning with what it is that they need, right? Yes. So if it's cancer, you know, it's getting all the questions answered to be able to make an informed decision, Right. Absolutely. So that's sort of what I was pulling from what you were saying there um, mm -hmm. in that, you know, it stems from loving yourself and then recognizing that, um, 
you are a person that's worthy. And from that place, you can then decide to take care of yourself. You can then decide to, you know, step up for yourself, um, respect yourself, and then, you know, let others know how you want to be respected and then advocate for yourself. Yes. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's it. The last and final step, trust God. Yeah. And I put that last on purpose. Um, I, my coach, um, she is phenomenal. And one of the things that she has in her pillars, because she has like six pillars, mm -hmm. and one of the things she has in her pillars is faith. And faith is not the first thing. And a lot of times, what she says, and I agree with, is a lot of times that as Christians, we believe that, you know, just have faith in God will do everything. And I, I, I think that in the back of my mind, I also maintain that at one point in my life. Yeah, just have faith. I don't have to do anything. As long as I have faith, God will fix everything. But the reality is faith without works is dead. Mm -hmm. So although you have faith and you trust God, you still have work to do. Yes. Yeah. Yes still have work to do. So that would be my last tip. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now you've been, okay. you've shared so well today. <laughs> I'm really thankful, you know, for you, for your story. And you, I know there's so many people out there um, because we know that one in three, one in three, you know, individuals have experienced something traumatic in their life. And the numbers are higher now for individuals that are touched with cancer or know somebody that has cancer, right? So we, I know your story will touch somebody um, and the, hopefully they'll be able to take something away from what you shared today. Yeah. Yes. All right. Last thing, Jenna, I want you to share with the audience how they can contact you. How can they, you know, find out more about your ministry and okay. yeah, how can how can they reach out to you if they need to consult with you? Yeah. So um, the ministry is called Nana by the Maker, and I am a post-trauma coach. Mm -hmm. um, I coach women uh, who are high thrivers. So basically, you look great on the outside, but on the inside, you're crumbling. Yeah. And also, people that are in a relationship that are in relationships that are kind of struggling because one person has had trauma and they just don't know how to move forward. Yeah. Uh, I can be reached on Instagram at Mended by the Maker, one word. On YouTube, Mended by the Maker, one word. On Facebook at Jenna Duncan. And my phone number or the business phone number is 905-744-0074. Let us know how we can support you. Yes, definitely, definitely. We will be putting those contact information in the description below when we post the full video. So you'll be able to make contact with Jenna if you need to. All right. Thank you so much for being with us, Jenna. We really appreciate you being here. And I would definitely want you to come back if you'd love to. Oh, I would love to. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. Thanks for having me. This was awesome. Well, there you have it, folks. Uh, Jenna, remember, Mended by the Maker. If that's the only thing you heard today, go check out her channel, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.